who have been following this series closely know that I only put credits in at the end of the arc. And that was fine when the arcs were three videos long and I wrote and shot them all at the same time. Now it's a bit more complicated than that. While I intend to continue making my videos this way, I do want to take a moment to remind all of you that, while my opinions and analyses are my own, I owe a great deal of debt to Konzenshu for the factual content. It's simple enough to analyze a work in one's own language, but a great deal more difficult when you're constantly second-guessing yourself as to the nuances of translation and having difficulties finding production-related material you can actually understand at all. And Konzenshu.com and its forums have been a godsend for me. I've been a regular visitor for over 13 years, and I suggest, if you don't already, that you do the same. With the day saved, a celebration dinner is held at the girl's house consisting of her entire family, the village chief, Goku, and Hachan. However, as the girl's father points out, despite them going through all that, the Dragon Ball was never found. This is when Hachan reveals that he's had the ball all along. Despite locking him in a cage, the Red Ribbon Army was apparently kind enough to let him frolic through the fields, which is when he stumbled upon it. But he heard at some point that White was planning to kill all the villagers when the ball was found, so Hachan decided to hide it. This is a good example of the Red Ribbon Army being too over-the-top evil for its own good. But the chief is so impressed by Hachan's actions that he offers to adopt him, something Hachan finds so touching it moves him to tears. Hachan asks Goku if he'll stay with them too, but this isn't Gohan's Dragon Ball, so Goku will be on the move again. However, he promises to visit. He won't. As they retire for the evening, the chief suggests that Hachan stay with the girl for the night to have a chance to say goodbye to Goku. The three of them discuss the Dragon Balls, and Goku offers to let the girl keep them, but she refuses on the grounds the army will come and kill her for them. Goku tries to show off the Dragon Radar, but it's no longer working and Hachan can't fix it. Goku believes it must have gotten damaged in the fighting, so now he has to find Bluma and have her repair it, despite the fact that the Western Metropolis is so far away. The next morning, the entire village is assembled to see Goku off, and they're amazed Goku is planning to walk to the Western Metropolis. When he explains that his Kintoon was destroyed, an old man recognizes the name, and he and the chief claim that back in the old days, people used to ride them all the time, because apparently people were much purer of heart back then. Not only that, but it seems a Kintoon can't be destroyed, and if Goku had just tried calling for it, he would have realized that. Again, like Namu's water conundrum, leave it to Toriyama to pull out a resolution that's both so ridiculous, yet makes so much sense. Still, it makes me wonder what exactly happened to Kintone that caused it to disappear in the first place. After Silver blows it up, we see a little puff of something in the sky. Maybe a few Kintone fragments? The best I can figure is that maybe the rocket blew Kintone apart and that it took time for the cloud to reform itself. So, Hachan and Jingle Village live happily ever after, despite the fact that Hachan still has a deadly explosive somewhere in his body. Good luck getting him through airport security! Now that we're out of Jingle Village, I do have to say that Muscle Tower definitely isn't the strongest point of the arc. It feels more like a video game, which isn't necessarily bad, but certain points do feel a bit tedious. And honestly, General White isn't that great of a villain. He's pretty generic, and it doesn't help that he's totally overshadowed by Murasaki, as evidenced by the fact that I put Murasaki in my intro and not White. Murasaki and Hachan are by far the highlights of this section of the story. While this stretch wasn't bad by any means, it certainly gets a lot better from here. Case in point, I love seeing Goku in the Western Metropolis. Not only is this something we've never seen before, a real urban area with all this futuristic architecture and technology, as opposed to the small towns we'd encountered up to this point, Goku's attempts to adapt are just hilarious. He can't understand this bizarre place in which someone who lives in the same town as Bluma wouldn't know who she is, or why he needs money for this taxi to give him a ride, or why this poster is advertising for Dragon Ball. And most horrifying of all, this place thinks Dragon Ball AF is a real thing! He does, however, understand beating people up, and a street boxer is offering a large amount of money to anyone who can best him. Now Goku has money. Two lowlifes, who apparently weren't paying attention to the kid who shattered the concrete wall, try to mug him. The remaining one suggests he ask a policeman where Bluma lives, and the first person who points out who a policeman is becomes a very rich woman. The policeman can't decipher Bluma's identity based on the picture Goku draws, but he does manage to find her on his Orwellian database. Also, for all of you hopeless nerds out there, Bluma's identification number has got to be the kind of salivating trivia right up there with the combination to Captain Kirk's safe. And with that, we arrive at Capsule Corporation and learn that Bluma is the heiress to the entire company. It's a pretty simple looking design, but more towards the end of the series, it will, like Kame House, be one of the most iconic locations from the entire series. Can you believe, though, that after we see it in this arc, it won't show up again until the Frieza arc? Also, in between chapters, it seems to have lost its awning, which is never seen again. 
The intercom informs them that Bloom is at school, but the intercom doesn't have Goku's nose, which can smell her coming. The police officer doesn't think she smells. Bloom is extremely excited to see Song Kun again, and nonchalantly explains that she ditched school. She invites them both inside up to the police and asks if they can tune up his bike. In true cartoon fashion, Capsule Corporation is larger inside than outside. It houses several robot servants in an indoor garden room where Bluma's dad keeps stray animals. Dr. Brief, always in his trademark lab coat and smoking his ever-present cigarette, invented the capsule, but is a bit airheaded, thinking that the policeman is the 12-year-old Son Goku his daughter had told him about. He also has a tendency to unhesitatingly blurt out awkward statements, like excitedly asking if Goku and Bloom are going up to her room to make out. We learn pretty quickly that in Bluma's home life, she seems to fill the role of the only sane person. Now, about that name. Burifu follows the naming scheme of his daughter. This time it's a play on the male undergarment briefs. However, it is written to be singular, it's not Burifusu. Also, a particularly common idea in the English-speaking fandom is that Brief is being presented here as a family name, which, in turn, makes the character's full name Bluma Brief. This is because the name Brief follows the title of Doctor, which in our world is usually a person's last name. But, with the exception of Son Goku and male members of his family, and the inhabitants of a particular village we'll soon get to, we don't really see any family names in this series. People have one name. Well, there is the alias Jackie Chun, but since it is an alias, there really can't even be a family to attach either of those names to. In fact, much, much later in the series, Vidal tells Gohan that she was able to deduce that Goku is his father due to the fact that they both have the family name Son, and that such a thing is very rare for people to have. Now, maybe that's something that Toriyama only came up with later. However, I'd be much more inclined to believe that if the Doctor's name was a pun on underwear in general. Then it would seem more likely that it's a family name that encompasses all of those characters. But since it's a pun that's an equivalent to Bluma, that is, a specific type of underwear, rather than a broader term, it seems likely that Brief is just intended to be his name. Also, even if it was a family name, it would most likely be Brief Bluma, the preferred naming order for the Japanese and natives of Bajor. Wow, two Star Trek references in one episode. While Red and Black are shocked to learn just what Goku looks like, Bluma is repairing the Dragon Radar and is surprised to find that he only has two of them at this point. What? It hasn't even been two days! I'd say he's doing remarkably well. I think this is just Toriyama getting confused by the passage of time. After all, we are nearly 15 weeks into this story in real time. After that many chapters in the first arc, they were recovering their sixth ball. That said, this line could help smooth over the whole timeline discrepancy for those who believe that Goku wandered around for four months looking for a signal, and thereby have had a year pass for the Dragon Balls to regenerate. With that, Bluma decides that since the next day is Sunday and she doesn't have school, she'll go with him. Goku objects and she can't ride Kintoon, but she reveals that she's invented a microband, or microband, that allows her to shrink into an easily transportable size. And at that exact moment, her mother walks in and steps on her. We see that her mother is just as ditzy as her father, offering sake to Goku and not understanding why Bluma is getting so frustrated. Goku asks about Yamcha and the others, and Bluma's mother explains that they're in school like they're supposed to be, and that Bluma's fighting with Yamcha because she's become extremely jealous over the fact that other girls find Yamcha handsome. Sadly, this is one of the only times we ever learn anything about their relationship, but I'm not going to get into that subject right now. Bluma declares that she's going off with Song Kun and finding a much better boyfriend this time. Funnily enough, both of her parents independently request she bring each of them back a mate. The police officer has his bike returned and is left to wonder about the eccentricities of rich people as Bluma becomes miniature and soars off on a magical flying cloud. However, he then realizes that his bike has been tuned up a bit too well and immediately crashes into someone's car. And Dr. Brief realizes, to his horror, that his daughter picked up his capsule case instead of her own.